Well, hello. I'm Dr. Stan Fleming, and uh, this is CLST course, Christian Life School of Theology. Um, it's BT 700, Understanding Islam in the Modern World, a Christian Perspective. And it's so great to be here with you this week. Um, I really appreciate the invitation from Jody and uh, from the school to be here. And I hope this is going to be a great week for you. I hope you're going to learn a lot and just uh, be immersed in understanding and, and get revelation in your hearts and in your spirits um, so that you can be kind of warriors for the kingdom of God in a sense of like uh, loving people and, and praying for people and winning people um, to come to know Jesus. And uh, I know that this is being recorded, that it's going out into many different places. And so welcome to all of you that are uh, listening to this, watching this from, uh, for, for being recorded as well. And so God bless you. Thank you for being here. I want to start off uh, looking at the table of contents. And I will share a little bit more about myself in a few minutes. But I want to kind of get into what we're going to be talking about here. And in the table of contents, I want to look at the lessons very briefly. We're going to be going through 10 uh, 50-minute sessions. And uh, then we'll take breaks in between. But uh, you can see lesson one is what in the world is happening. Uh, lesson two, the roots of Islam. Lesson three, the rise of Muhammad. Lesson four, fighting to dominate. Lesson five, formidable frontiers. Lesson six, the tenets of belief. Lesson seven, the sex of Islam. Lesson eight, controversy and conflict. Lesson nine, building bridges. And lesson 10, reaching Muslims for Christ. Now, perhaps um, some of you know Muslims or you've had experience with them before. You've been in contact with them before. I'm really hoping that you're going to get a lot out of this course in understanding some ideas about maybe the way that they see the world. And uh, so, because this is from a Christian perspective. And so let's go over to the course syllabus now and look through that. It's a couple pages later. Um, the course description up at the top of the page, an overview of the religion of Islam, including its history, changes, and impact on modern civilization from a Christian perspective. It includes the origins, beliefs, and various cultural mores of Islam, the spiritual power of the gospel message, the spiritual battle in which the church is engaged, supernatural miracles, conversion experiences, and the missional responsibilities are also discussed. You know, there's a lot of information out there today about Islam, uh, but there's not too many people talking about uh, the Muslims that are getting saved and the, and the uh, actual miraculous experiences that are taking place around the world, well, I'm going to be talking about some of those, as well as try to give an overview of, of the many aspects of Islam in the best way that I possibly can. Uh, I don't know if you've taken any of my other courses through CLST, but you know I really try to surround a subject and look at every different aspect of it so that students can get the best education possible. You can see the course objectives there. Students will be able to, A, provide knowledge of the religion of Islam through the perspective of biblical Christianity. B, give examples of the religious activities and the ideologies of modern Muslims, both those who are moderate and those who are radical. C, adjust from any state of indifference to one of compassion for Muslims through the challenge to pray, love, and witness. I'm really big about that in all of my uh, teachings. I teach other courses on cults and some on world religions. And, you know, we, we need to realize that, that God can use prayer. He can use love and he can use witness to change the world out there. Uh, my ministry is called Gatebreaker Ministries. And so basically it's based upon Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so, you know, God has a whole arsenal of people that he can use in different ways. Uh, letter D, explain similarities and differences of the major sects and branches of Islam. E, distinguish religious strengths and weaknesses, expose theological dilemmas, and break down social, cultural components. And then finally, F, uh, categorize and evaluate various sections of the Quran, including those that relate stories about Jesus Christ. 
And then um, you need to have this textbook, um, Allah Weeps, uh, A Christian Perspective of Modern Radical Islam by me, S.F. Fleming, that's my pen name. And then let's go over to actually the first, we go over to the first lesson. Skip over to there. And what in the world is happening is the name of the lesson. And I want to, uh, at the beginning of each talk, each time that we're speaking, and by the way, we might not always go 50 minutes. It just kind of depends on the length of, of uh, teaching material for that particular um, lesson. But, uh, and I do hope to have some, some uh, hope to break you up into groups at times, if possible. Um, to do a little bit of uh, converse, uh, conversation with one another. But I want to read this uh, at the top of the page uh, about Mario. It says, when Mario, his name was Joseph, woke, uh, awoke, he saw his dad standing over him with a knife. His father removed Mario's chains and told his son he could live if he came back to Islam. His dad warned, if you want to be a Christian, I have to kill you. Mario had no doubt his dad would do this since he was simply obeying the Quran, which says, kill the apostates. But Mario decided in his heart not to forsake Christ. Praise God. At that moment, Mario was hit with a surge of power and screamed out, Jesus. His father collapsed to the floor, foaming at the mouth, and in the fall cut himself on his chest with a knife. With the knife. Mario was able to escape. Because he left Islam and converted to Christianity, Mario's life is in constant danger from extremists, but he believes God is preserving his life. He has even preached in the Middle East without trouble. Uh, though his life has been threatened, Mario continues on because he does not fear death. He says it is foolishness to fear death because we are all eventually going to die one day, and when we do, we will be with Christ. And so, you know, that's kind of the beginning of where we're at here. There are Muslims that are turning to Jesus Christ today. Um, in many different ways. And these stories, I've, all, I've looked them up, I've, I've verified them, so they're all true. Um, now, I, want, I should share a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in various places, and um, that is me in 1978. Uh, and, you know, I was a full-blown hippie, basically. Uh, went on a search for the truth, and it's a really long story that I share in some of my other um, uh, teachings, but I was in great, great darkness. And, um, you know, it's not only Muslims that have dreams of Jesus. I actually had a dream of Jesus that led me out of great darkness and into his marvelous light. And um, so God had mercy upon me, and, and he healed my mind. Um, if you knew where I was at all those years ago, you probably wouldn't even believe it. I've had to tell big groups of people before, but, you know, there, there's no miracles beyond God's power. So he reached into a guy who was, um, well, just crazy, and, and he healed my mind, and uh, then he healed my heart, and um, this is my wife and I, uh, kind of look like Jeremiah Johnson there, if you ever saw the movie, uh, my wonderful wife Kathleen, and our baby girl Naphtali, um, and that's in uh, northern Idaho, where we... Uh, lived for many years, and then um, this is us years later, and you know I just love her. She's the love of my life, and she sends her greetings to you, by the way. And um, she is a school teacher. She uh, teaches sixth grade uh, middle school. She has the toughest job in the world. She teaches um, uh, English writing composition, and so to about 150 or 60 kids, sixth graders every single day. And many of them, uh, English is not their first language. So she has a real tough job. Uh, we got in the ministry so many years ago. My background was education. Um, when you saw me on the uh, right there, I just graduated from the University of Nevada in Reno. And I got my degree in elementary education. The Lord told me to become a teacher after I got saved. And then uh, I, as I moved up to northern Idaho. And a church there asked me to help start a Christian school, so I did that. Uh, my wife and I, she taught French, that was her degree, and, um, and I, I ran the school and taught many different 
grade levels. And then I eventually got my master's in um, teaching and with endorsement in special education. And then finally, in 1991, I was asked to become a pastor. And so I, I did. I became the pastor of the church uh, that the school was in. It was called House of the Lord um, in Old Town, Idaho. And so I went back to school and I got my doctorate in practical ministry and theology and practical ministry. And when it came time to do my dissertation, uh, the Lord told me to do it on cults and world religions and the occult because in my search for the truth, I had pretty much walked through all of that um, when Jesus found me. And so I, uh, I wrote a book called Gatebreakers. That was my dissertation. Somebody said, you have to get this published because there's nothing like it on the market today. And so I did, and all of a sudden people started inviting me places to speak about cults and world religions and the occult and things like that. And I was very active in leading mission teams anyway. So I uh, started traveling extensively, and as well as being a lead pastor and running a school. And then fortunately, somebody else came in to run the school. I uh, started to get a bit overwhelmed um, in about 2005 as I was traveling so much. And then in 2007, uh, the Lord had worked it out for us to turn the church over to some other wonderful folks. And we stepped, or I stepped full time into Gay Breaker Ministries. And so since 2007, we've relocated down to the Boise area. And I travel out of there. And I've gone many different places. These are five children, um, my son and four daughters. And I have four grandchildren. How many of you have grandchildren in here? So they are wonderful. Uh, it's great to have grandkids. And so that's a little bit about my family. Uh, so I want to do a little bit of housekeeping here, uh, looking at the, the notes. Um, I think I'll begin with this. If you take the book, All the Weeps, and if you turn to page 201, you'll see in the back there that there is a glossary. And so a lot of the names... Um, you know, that are in the book are talked about in there. There's just a little bit given about each one, but it kind of is a guide to some of the uh, things that are happening in uh, Islam today. And some of the, uh, if you need to kind of have a little bit of a dictionary, there's a glossary for you. I think you'll find that each of the chapters of the book, uh, which I will be reading a little bit of this here and there, uh, but I think you'll find that they are full of information and it took me a very long time to write this. I actually wrote my first book on Islam um, just post 9-11. Uh, and uh, three, two months after 9-11 happened in 2001, my publisher called me up and said, Stan, we want a book on Islam and we want it now. And so uh, I, I got to work, worked very hard and wrote a book on Islam. And then um, all these years later, here is the second book. And so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, unfortunately, in the syllabus, there are some typos, so I'm sorry about that. You'll see a few of those. There aren't too many, but there's a few. And um, also, they, the, they did not put in the page numbers, I noticed. Right. So uh, I'm like, what? So unfortunately, <laughs> uh, mine has page numbers. You know, <laughs> That's what I sent to them. But anyway, sorry about that. So hopefully they can correct that for future. But um, maybe one of you would be very active and eager to go through and uh, put page numbers so that just in case we need to refer the group to a certain page, you would be able to say, okay, it's on page 44 or something like that. that so, oh, you've already done it. Okay. So um, I might call upon you then for that very thing. Thank you so much. Um, and then what you're going to see on the slides is I, I use a lot of, I use a lot of slides and, um, you're going to see uh, things that are in red that will be underlined. That's what you're going to fill in the blank on your notes. Okay, now you can write down any other information that you want to, but the things that are going to be critical for you to get are the things that are in red that are underlined, bold, um, in the notes. And, um, I, and then questions. You, you might have a question, um, and so I hope to have time for that. 
uh, depending on, on how much uh, time I have. So uh, if I do, I, I might take a question here or there. I'll try to remember to read it back for the video audience. And um, so, yeah, uh, I would like you to open up your books now to pages 17, starting on page 17. And I want to talk about who this is written for. You know, why is this book written? Um, and why are we developing this course? So on the second paragraph there, at the bottom of page 17, uh, this book has been written for those who want to learn more about Islam in the modern world from a Christian perspective. Um, it has been written for Christians, Muslims, or any others who are searching for answers and who are open to consider the Christian perspective on the topic. There are many good secular books about Islam, but they do not always recognize the spiritual power of the gospel message, the spiritual battle in which we are engaged, or that supernatural miracles, uh, conversion experiences, kingdom expansion exists, and they completely ignore the missional responsibilities of the church. If you go to a bookstore today, any large bookstore, you'll see a lot of books on Islam. Uh, I must tell you, I mean, they can all be great books, and I have some of those books, but quite often they are written from a secular perspective. There's simply an academic someplace, a scholar, who has picked up a subject and, and is writing about it. So you can learn a lot from those, but there's actually not that many books, first of all, that are written by Christians about the subject of Islam, number one. And then there's not hardly any books at all that are written from a, a spirit-filled perspective, if you will, about what God is doing around the world through, through all kinds of uh, you know, power encounters with the Holy Spirit and things of that nature. I want to read this other paragraph. Along with these challenges, it is vitally important for Christians to understand crucial issues facing Islam today. We will investigate both the modern and historical elements of Islam, as well as the Quran, the pillars of the Islamic faith, and its primary doctrines. What, uh, what is it uh, that has helped to grow and sustain Islam in the world? Why does it seem so formidable? What exactly is fundamental or Islamic fundamentalism? And why does it attract so many Muslims? At what rate is Islam growing in our world today? What is the commitment level of the average Muslim? Is the religion of Islam losing adherence? In what ways can Christians reach out to Muslims with prayer, love, and witness of the gospel? How does the Bible tell Christians to respond to the people of other faiths? And why are so many Muslims beginning to experience dreams and visions of the Lord Jesus Christ in these modern times? And so it really covers a lot. Uh, the book does and the course uh, adds to it. So, okay, so one of the reasons that I'm teaching this course is because CLST approached me a couple of years ago and really asked me twice actually to write a course on Islam. So in my, you know, as you get to know me, my, my schedule is really swamped and so it took me quite a long time to get to the point where where I could actually uh, have time to create the course, but here it is. Uh, and thank you for being the guinea pigs here the first <laughs> night on um, at, that we are teaching. So, um, of course, there are many amazing stories of Muslims converting to Christianity that we will talk about. Uh, let us see in your notes. At the same time, there are Muslims who proclaim that Islam is the true religion of peace, while others who are radical Islamic terrorists go on killing sprees, yelling, uh, Alua Akbar, which means God is great in Arabic. So what in the world is happening? So I want to just share with you briefly some some personal things um, you know we we see on TV and, and maybe you've had this happen as well but we a lot of times we're watching on TV as we hear about just terrible horrific uh, acts uh, by Islamic radicals you know killing people around the world or in different places and uh, I'm not sure about you but that some of those hit pretty close home for me um, for instance, in 2013, there was the attack at the Boston Marathon. You guys remember that? Um, well, my daughter-in-law was working in the medical tent 100 yards away from where the bombs went off. And so uh, she was a physical, she is a physical therapist, and as the marathon runners were fi finishing the race, um, she was helping them. 
uh, along with many others. Well, that tent uh, turned into a triage center uh, within a matter of, of three minutes. And because of all those doctors there and nurses and people, they saved numerous lives. But she will never forget that. In 2014, I was in uh, Nairobi, a little city outside of Nairobi, teaching at Kenya College of Ministry that I helped start in 2009. And I go there three times a year and I teach in that college there. Well, you know, Al-Shabaab blew up a bus just about eight clicks from where I was at, you know, killing many people. In 2015, there were attacks in France at the Charlie Hebdo uh, newspaper office and, uh, and then at the Bataclan Theater later on that year. Well, we have friends in Paris who have planted numerous churches and we support their, they are missionaries, we support them. They've been there for many years. And so, and they marched in the parade um, for, for unity. And that, one of those uh, killing things happened just a couple of blocks from their church. Plus that, two of my daughters spent a year in their church at different times, um, you know, being missionaries over there in France. So it all hits very close home. And then in 2016, uh, there was an attack in, uh, in a place in Pakistan called Lahore. And two of my friends who are pastors there, uh, they had people on Easter Sunday who were doing picnics out in the park. Christians were gathering there. And um, suicide bombers went in there and blew themselves up and killed all of these Christians. They were attacking. They were targeting Christians. And uh, one of my friends had family members that were killed in that. And the other one had people in his church that were killed in that. So these things uh, hit very close to home. These and other attacks have been carried out by Islamic terrorist organizations like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, and others to spread confusion and fear. Now, what are some important words? We're going to move on from there. Um, the world is full of confusion, political posturing, and manipulation, and I could talk to you a lot about that, but I think you already kind of know that. Um, now, you can see uh, we start off with the word Allah, and that is the God of Islam under letter A. And then there is this word Hadith, and you can write that in the blank there, Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H. It means tradition, and it is one of Islam's holy books, Hadith. Uh, the Hajj, uh, this is a pilgrimage of Mecca, and we will be going over these words again uh, in, in different applications, but here they are just in the way of being important words. There is Islam, of course. It means submission to Allah, the God of Muhammad. There is Jihad, which is efforts on God's path, which is roughly translated as holy war. There is the word uh, Kaaba, K-A-B-A-H, and this is the temple in Mecca. There is the word Quran, of course. It's spelled different ways, and uh, it means to recite. Uh, it, the, it is the holy book of Islam, the, the main one. There is Mecca, the city in Saudi Arabia, and the birthplace of Muhammad. There is Muslim. It means one who is submitted to God and then, um, or to Islam. And then there is the word Salat, which is... Uh, prayer or, or to pray, symbolizing the five steps of Muhammad's night journey. Uh, there is the word son, psalm, rather, which is the fast during the month of Ramadan. Uh, the word shahada, which is the creed of Islam, which we will look at later. Zakat, uh, this is uh, Muslims giving 2.5% of their uh, monthly income to the poor. And so, you know, there's things that we will learn about Muslims and how they go about their life, things that they do that probably most of you did not know before. Now, how to approach this course? How to approach this course? Well, I believe that Christians need um, some different things. Uh, we need to have wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 4, 5 and 7 says, get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. I think probably the biggest thing that we as Christians need to, to get today, honestly, as we face this, uh, uh, you know, the second largest religion in the world that is just expanding and growing and aggressively um, taking uh, space in the world, uh, spreading their doctrines, is wisdom. 
you know, wisdom of how we go about, um, you know, evangelizing, wisdom and how we go about even loving, how we go about sharing the gospel, how we go about defending, if you will. I mean, I'm an apologist. How, how do you go about defending the faith of Jesus Christ um, and, and Christianity? And then there is Colossians. Uh, we need to walk in wisdom, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. We need to walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. And I love this. I've always liked verse 6. Let your speech, please say that, let your speech. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And, of course, this isn't just about Muslims. This is about life. This is about how we go through our lives, how we deal with our neighbors, how we deal with the people behind the counter. Um, I don't know, just I, I was mentioning this last night. I was teaching at our church on um, uh, another subject, on apologetics. And, you know, it just kind of occurred to me as, as we are light in the world, you know, we are called to be light in the world. Sometimes it's just as simple as asking somebody how they're doing, uh, actually taking time and, and caring about somebody else. So I've kind of found myself in the last six months or so as I go into a marketplace or whatever, just to take a few moments and ask somebody how, how they're doing. You know, um, I remember uh, this one lady, I uh, went into a supermarket and, and she looked really pale and I just said, how are you doing? And um, she goes, oh, she was a checker, she was a checker. And she goes, I kind of feel a, a little bit faint. And I, I don't know, I'm usually not this bold, but I just kind of went, the Lord heal you in Jesus' name. <laughs> and she was a bit shocked, but then she thanked me uh, for it. And so, you know, we just need to uh, be people that spread the light and, and, and how we go about just walking, um, you know, seasoned with salt and, and knowing how to answer each one. I want to... Uh, Go to Ephesians 6. I believe Christians should put on the spiritual armor. And in Ephesians chapter 6, you know, we have the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. And reading in verse, beginning in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on... Please say that after me. Put on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one don't, don't you just wish some days you could just get up and just suddenly have on that shield of faith, and man, all of those darts of the enemy just fall to the ground. But sometimes we get up and we forget to put on the shield of faith. You know, we forget to take it up. And, and so one or two of those might make it through. But when we remember, all of a sudden, bam, they all go falling down. And then verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the sword of God, and finally, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful um, to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all of the saints. And so powerful, powerful message. You know, we need to put on the spiritual armor of God in our lives every single day, really, as we as we go out and kind of do the battle. Now, we don't think of every day as a battle and uh, hopefully you know, you aren't always getting up every day thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to fight today. But it's kind of like C.S. Lewis said one time that he woke up in the morning and, and, and it just seemed like, you know, if he didn't take time in the word of God and, and just kind of get his heart set right, it was like all of the issues of the day came rushing in him like wild animals. You know, well, that's kind of the way my life is at times. I don't know about you, but I, I think we're probably kind of all like that at moments of time. Um. Christians should know that 
in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, Christians should know that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. He is the God of peace. You follow the God of peace. You follow the God of peace. By the way, if you ever have a big choice to make in life, it, it, it's good to probably take the choice that gives you the most peace. I had a, had a woman when I, uh, way back years and years and years ago, uh, when I was first giving my life to Jesus Christ and I was working in a rest home. And I, I didn't know anything about church. I just knew about Jesus Christ because I'd met him. I didn't know anything about Christians. I was reading the Bible. But I had, I had a big, I had a, I had a, a t-shirt with a big fish on the back, you know. And I go around and I witness to people about Jesus, even though I didn't even go to church. And, and I remember there was this woman in the rest home, and she had been uh, a Christian in World War II Germany. And, and she was helping to save the Jews. And, but when I met her, she was an old woman, and she was actually um, dying of terminal cancer. But for several months there, she, she mentored me. And uh, I remember one time I had this big decision to make. And I asked her, I said, what should I do? And she said, well, Stan, whenever you have a big decision to make in life, take the path that gives you the most peace because therein lies the path of God for your life. And I've never forgotten those words. And so I kind of think that, I think that's true. Um, and then 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. I love this. But of power, um, excuse me, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, let's read this out loud together. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Now, in Christianity today, unfortunately, sometimes people get afraid. Well, you know, that's when we have to seek the Lord. And, and have the peace of the Lord come and invade our lives, come into our lives and take over all the dark areas and, and, and let the light come forth because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And of course, this word power is the word dunamis. Uh, today, what we see happening around the world at unprecedented levels is Muslims having uh, dreams of Jesus, and, and then they come uh, to a rally like I might have. And, and, and I've, I've seen it happen many times. Uh, they, they, don't, they, don't know, they don't know about Jesus, and so they come to a rally, and all of a sudden they give their lives to Jesus Christ. You know, they, they're having dreams or visions. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to sit down and have lunch with an Iranian who, a scientist actually, who while he was in Iran, he had a, a dream one night and, and he didn't know anything about Jesus. And all of a sudden he's having this dream of Jesus and, he's, and, and it led to his conversion basically, which eventually led to him getting out of Iran and coming to the United States of America. Um, in Pakistan, I've heard such stories of, of Muslims uh, having dreams of Jesus. They've explained them to me. Uh, with tears in their eyes just before they were giving their lives to Christ. Um, now, this is not one of those individuals, but he had a very compelling story as well. He was an officer um, in the Pakistani army, and he heard that I was speaking, and so he came um, to listen to me preach, and then he, he gave his life to Jesus Christ, and right there he wanted to be baptized. And so we went out in this baptismal in the back and baptized him. Now, um, a modern portrait of, of Islam. I'm going to read through this. Uh, Islam was started by Muhammad in the 7th century in Arabia and has grown to become the second largest religion in the world, second only to Christianity. At the heart of Islamic teachings is the Quran, which supposedly contains revelations from God to Muhammad. Moderate Muslims, that's what you write in the blank right there, moderate Muslims interpret the teachings of Muhammad to live in peace. But jihadist Muslims interpret the teachings of Muhammad to spread Islam through violence and war. Of the approximate 1.7 billion Muslims, and by the way, it's slated to grow to uh, 2.7 by the year 2050, of the approximate 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, jihadist Muslims make up possibly 15 to 25 percent, 
And it is from these that the world has witnessed decades of Islamic terrorist attacks and wars. Now, when you think about Islam today and that, that number of people, 1.7 billion in the world, and there's roughly seven, you know, maybe seven and a third billion people in the world today. Uh, Christianity is the largest religion, but, but uh, Islam is, is really on the rise and catching up. Well, when you consider that number of people, most of them are peace-loving. They simply want to you know, have families, they want to have jobs, they want to raise their children, they want to do well, they want to prosper. Um, but when you take 15 to 25 percent of 1.7 billion, that's a, a lot of people. And so uh, unfortunately, that's a lot of people that kind of want to do harm at times uh, and, and that are considered jihadist Muslims. Uh, the two main sects of Islam are Shia and Sunni. They differ in their concept of religious authority, theology, religious practices, and interpretation of the Quran. By the way, I should say this regarding those, those statistics of 15 to 25 percent. These are statistics that people like the CIA and others put out there. Okay, so these are not just um, random statistics. And there are people that will try to debate that. They will say, oh, no, there's not that many Muslims that are violent or radical. But it would appear that there are when you look um, at, at the country by country and what they do. That's not to say that they all get out there and take a gun or a bomb or whatever. But they support the notion of it is the idea there. So uh, once again, the two main sects, Sunni and Shia. And then the vast majority of Muslims in the world are Sunni. Uh, between 80 to 85 percent, the Shia minority account for 15 to 20 percent with large populations in Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and India. Now, Islam is trapped in the 7th century. The 7th century is what you write in the blank because that was the perfect era of Muhammad, so to speak. In some Islamic countries, women are forced to wear burqas, B U R. Um, QAS, out of fear of beatings, arrests, or honor killings. In, in various parts of the world, Muslim women must suffer female circumcision, and many are illiterate. Under Sharia law, a woman's testimony in court is a, half that of a man's. A daughter's inheritance is half that of her brother. A wife cannot leave the house or the country without her husband's permission. If a woman is raped, there must be four witnesses. Otherwise, the man normally goes free. All right. Now, some of the modern complexities with radical Islamic terrorists. The Islamic State. On June 29, 2014, ISIS announced the establishment of the new caliphate. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was named the caliph. He's now known as Caliph Ibrahim. And you can see on the map here, you have, um, you know, the Iraq. ISIS began with, with the radical Sunni. So realize that, that ISIS and, and Sunni, Jihad, all of that, they are, you know, they're kind of under the same banner. Um, and then... On the, on the left side here, the brown area, uh, that's actually part of the Shiite, uh, kind of a, a hybrid of the Shiites. They're called the Twelvers. We'll talk about that later on. And then you can see the Shiite state down on the right. So a lot of the problems, a lot of the tension, I'm sure you're well aware of this, in the Middle East is over the rift between the Shiites and the Sunni and how they fight back and forth. And unfortunately, a lot of times we go over there and we get right in the middle of what's going on, and we don't even know which side is which side uh, and what's going on. Um, okay, so ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Uh, we'll look at these again later, but very briefly, ISIS stands for Islamic State. Um, I'm just, I'm still, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't made it to America Remembers yet, okay? So I'm just kind of adding things here. ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. ISIL stands for Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is a much larger area. So in some sense, uh, President Obama, I think, was correct when he used the word ISIL 
because their goal was to dominate a large area. The Levant includes Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Cyprus, and the southern part of Turkey. Of course, ISIS was known for its brutality. It massacred both Christians and a group called Yazidis, which were a monotheistic religion. In the summer of 2014, there were multiple attacks in 2015. Um, including in Paris in 2016, the UN said that ISIL had more than 3,500 slaves. Today now, um, under the current administration, a lot of, of the caliphate has been wiped out and has been pushed back. Um, however, what unfortunately has happened is that ISIS has kind of morphed now, and so they, they've kind of, they're in an alliance with uh, Al-Qaeda, and now they're in about 30 countries of the world with bases in about 30 countries of the world. So it doesn't look like the problem is going away anytime soon. It just kind of readjusts itself. Uh, now, a caliphate uh, is, a, is an Islamic state under Sharia law, which is led by a supreme religious and political leader known as a caliph, who considers himself as a successor of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. And there's been a number of different caliphates in history that we will look at later. Um, we know that ISIS, uh, they televised uh, beheadings and, uh, you know, just terrible things. They would put it out there for everyone to see. This method of killing is prescribed in the Quran, which says, quote, when ye encounter the infidels, strike off their heads till ye have made a great slaughter among them, end quote. That's Surah 47.4. And we know that Muhammad used this method at least once to kill 700 Jews um, that did not stand with him. And um, let's see. I wanted to share this with you. I, um, I have in my pocket here a piece of the Iron Curtain. For those of you that are old enough, you remember in 1989 when the Iron Curtain fell. It's what was on television. I mean, everybody in the world was, was watching. You know, there's just a few events in my lifetime where it seemed like everybody in the world was watching. And I could name them on one hand. But uh, everybody was watching as people took sledgehammers and they were just pounding down the walls of the Iron Curtain that separated East and West Berlin and basically separated East Berlin and Russia, everything to the east of that, which was behind the Iron Curtain, so to speak, because there was no freedom there, it was just communism, and everything to the west of that, which was considered free. And, you know, it came down, and then, you know, Christianity spread into Russia. Um, there was uh, numerous amazing things that happened at that time. We sometimes think that Islam is a giant that just cannot be overcome. But I want to tell you that there is a God in heaven, and, and, and we never quite know what series of circumstances might lead to a certain point where all of a sudden, on one day, like in, I think it was November of 1989, the wall comes down, and, and people suddenly get enlightened, and um, there is a change in the status of freedom for humanity. Um, now, if we look at um, Islam by the millions, you can see, I know this isn't a very dark map, but in the bottom left-hand corner there um, is Indonesia. That would be my left, your right, I guess. Indonesia, which has 203 million um, Muslims in it today. It's the largest Islamic nation in the world. A second to that is Pakistan, 174. And Pakistan, um, of course, has the bomb, the nuclear bomb. And so they are a uh, giant among the Islamic countries. Uh, they are second only to uh, Indonesia, and they are supposed to overtake Indonesia here in population in a couple of decades. And then if uh, the United States has about 2 million, this says, um, it probably has about 2.6 million, something like that, somewhere under 3 million adherents in the United States today. I remember after 9-11, I was on about 100 different radio programs, and there were people that were saying there were estimates as many as 15 million in America. Well, that just was exaggerated. That wasn't, that's not true. Um, and 
but there are, you know, a significant amount of the top five populations are in Detroit, Washington, D.C., Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Philadelphia, and New York. There are over 2,300 mosques, schools, and organizations in our state. California has 198, and then Idaho, where I'm from, has three. So, very small. Now, you can go to Dearborn, Michigan. This mosque uh, is in Dearborn, Michigan. And you can actually hear the public call to prayer, unfortunately. Um, and, and so there's a, a pretty large amount of Muslims in that place. Now, some of the things that happen in those calls, how many of you have ever heard an uh, Islamic call to prayer? Maybe you've gone to foreign countries. Okay, some of you have. Um, one of the things that is, one of the lines that is repeated as the call to prayer goes out is, I bear witness that there is no God but the one God, meaning Allah. That's one of the things that is said. And then one of the portions of the Quran that is often recited, not always, but that is often recited is this. Quote, he, meaning Allah, begets not, nor is he begotten. That, that specifically is targeting Christians who believe in the Son of God. And so once again, he, Allah, begets not, nor is he begotten. Now, we all remember, probably, in this room, 9-11. Uh, and you can probably remember what you were doing. Uh, I was running a church in northern Idaho, and we had a Christian school. Uh, we were at school. We were at the church. And I also had was supposed to have a meeting that day with um, a a nonprofit organization that I'm a part of down in the border of Texas and Mexico, uh, New Border Ministries, uh, that reaches out to people. But that meeting got canceled. Our school closed down. We, we lowered the flag to half mass. And then, you know, our church went into prayer mode, probably along with most of the other churches in the United States, as well as just people all over the place. And uh, then people were raising money, sending money to New York, uh, we know the terrible story of, of the, you know, the 19 hijackers that, you know, took planes into the buildings and uh, one went down in Pennsylvania, which was going to target the capital of the United States. They were heroes, of course, that took that plane down. Uh, we know the stories. Uh, I believe it was 2,977 victims is what they figure. Uh, and then 19 hijackers that died in that horrific event that brought America to its knees and uh, changed us forever, really. Um, it changed the way that we do things. It changed travel in our country. Uh, it used to be a lot easier to travel. Every year, America remembers. Uh, this is just from a few days ago, the 2018 memorial service. You know, they will, they will say the name of an individual while, while it's quiet and people are praying. They'll ring a little bell and then they will say another name of an individual who died in the attack. And so we solemnly remember every single year, it's been 17 years, and we remember. Um, and I'm very proud of our country. I'm proud of who we are, the way that we've responded, and what we've tried to do um, for New York and, uh, and to help the world. You know, it's, it's a messy thing that we live in. The world's not always easy at times, but... I know America tries to do what it can to help. Um, now, most Americans do not remember, however, they, might, they will remember 9-11, but they probably don't remember October 12, 2002, when in Indonesia, um, there was a bombing at a sorry nightclub in Bali, and uh, where over 200 individuals were killed. There was a tape recording by Osama bin Laden that was found where he had been targeting the Australians uh, for their help in, the pre in one of the previous wars. And so he wanted to um, attack them because he didn't want them coming back to the Middle East. Well, I certainly remember this because at this time I was in Japan and I was actually, believe it or not, speaking at a CLST school there at that time in Japan and uh, preaching at churches and at two different schools there. And I was supposed to go to Indonesia 
to actually speak at another school. And uh, the pastor there and I uh, were going to go. And we heard about this explosion. We heard about the people dying. We heard that the airports were closing down. We wondered if we could even get into Indonesia. Wasn't sure. But um, I can see that we have already spent 50 minutes of this hour. So that time went really quick, quicker than I expected. So we're actually going to take a break. I'm going to pick up this story on the other side of the break. And so we're going to take a 10-minute break here. And um, yeah, so let's do it.